Today we're going to be replacing the engine on this Lexus ES350. This is a 3.5 liter V6 Toyota 2GR engine and it's got a really loud knocking sound coming from the top end. And after a compression check and boroscoping these cylinders, I found the ones at the back there where the pistons collided with the valves. Now the theory is that you could disconnect this engine at the bell housing here and just take the engine itself out and not disconnect everything else like your steering rack or the subframe or transmission. Or you could just drop the entire assembly out the bottom, but I don't have a hoist. Now as part of my diagnostics, I've already removed the air intake battery as well as the air intake plenum to get to the spark plugs at the back there. And I've also removed the alternator and moved the AC compressor out of the way to diagnose that sensor code that I was getting. But you don't have to do any of that. I'm remove the air box. I'm gonna remove the wheel. Remove the axle nut. Disconnect the ball joint. Should be able to pop this axle out. This will be the hardest part of the job, getting this bearing out of this carrier so the engine itself can be free. Luckily my axle was replaced before by somebody, so this thing wasn't seized in there. Next I gotta get the exhaust off for bank one and for bank two. Also gotta disconnect the oxygen sensors and then drop this Y pipe down. Alright, I got the exhaust hanging down here. Next I'm gonna tackle that power steering pump because that's gonna stay with the body of the car. Alright, we got that pump out of the way. I have a feeling it would have been easier to deal with the mess than to just take this thing off. Next up between the engine and the transmission, we're going to get the flex plate bolts off. Those flex plate bolts are pretty tight. Next up, I'm going to remove all the 14mm bell housing bolts at the bottom here that I can get to. Now up at the top here, I'm going to attempt to take the engine out separated from the transmission. So hopefully I don't have to disconnect the AC lines, the power steering or axles or anything like that. So the wiring harness will have to stay with the engine, which means I have to disconnect it from the fuse box and the transmission side. I'll also have to disconnect the EVAP line and the fuel line as well as the heater core hoses on this side. Now on the passenger side, I need to remove this dog bone mount. I'm going to just angle these a little bit further down to give you enough clearance here. Uh, that bolt doesn't even want to go. i got to jack up the engine. Now. I can pull out that bolt. Be able to pull out this guy. Now that I've jacked up the engine, I'm trying to get this mount off here. All right, we got this guy free here. Right, now we should get it out. This thing looks rough. So much oil from that timing cover. Now with the engine mount out of the way, I gotta remove this bracket because it's gonna crash into the frame when I lift it up. Get rid of this belt. Now on top of the transmission, I need to remove all of this wiring harness because it actually belongs to the engine side as well as the starter motor. After all the picking and prying, I was able to get that wiring harness out. There's no way that a junkyard would spend time to pick all of these out, so I'm probably gonna have to swap this over. All right, I'm gonna get the starter out. It's a 12 millimeter. There's two 14s on the sides of the starter. There's the starter. I actually didn't need to pull the starter because I thought some of the bolts would run through the bell housing, but they're pretty short. Now over on the passenger side, I gotta remove this ground. I'm gonna remove the ECU connector and leave the harness with the engine. And I'm not gonna remove this bracket because I'm actually gonna use it to lift up this side of the engine. Next, I'm gonna get out all the bell housing bolts. There's two 17 millimeters down at the bottom there behind the engine mount. And there's three across the top here and then one at the back there. Don't you hate it when this happens? You can't even get the stubbiest socket that you have onto here. You're gonna have to use a wrench. All right, so I've got all the bell housing bolts out and I've double checked all the way around the engine that everything is clear to lift it up. I'm hoping I have enough clearance on this side just to get it off of the transmission dowels. Well, they got the engine crane up on there, but I'm having a hell of a time trying to break the transmission loose at the bell housing. So what I might do is actually pull the transmission with it. It's just a shifter linkage, an axle at the back there, a transmission mount on the side there. There's two coolant lines at the front here and then this mount to the front. So once I get that done, I'm going to see if I can sort of tilt this and get it out somehow. So here's where I'm at. I've got the radiator out and I've also taken out the cooler lines and the shifter cable. I'm hoping I can clear this bracket over here for the battery as I take it out. Maybe slide it up this way. And here under the driver's side, you can see I've taken out the axle over here and this transmission mount. Again, I'm hoping I can push the engine that way somehow so it can clear the body. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to do a subframe drop. All right, this is the kind of most exciting part, but also the most critical. Everything is loose. Of course, now is when you're going to find those things you forgot to disconnect. Like this little bracket over here that connects the AC line to the engine. Why couldn't they just tie it to the body? I think the trick is you really got to rotate the engine out like this. And I got to lower the car down so I can get enough clearance up here. And I pretty much got this thing loose inside of here. Just got to jack it up a little bit more. Make sure it clears the hood. So now I got the engine and transmission out. I'm going to see what was trying to hang this thing up here. I think the biggest thing is trying to get the weight to balance between the transmission and the engine. Well, no wonder I didn't want to pry out from inside of the engine bay. I probably would have avoided taking out this transmission, but that's okay. It's probably easier to line everything back up outside anyway. It definitely felt like there was an extra bolt in there, but I couldn't find it. <sighs> now, this thing should probably just fall right off now. 
one little bolt caused me an extra hour or two just getting this thing out. Alright, let's see if we can get it out easier this time. I thought it was a dowel that was stuck. I hope and pray this thing works. I never drove this car. Now this thing had a pretty active rear main seal leak, but it actually wasn't leaking from the seal itself. It was leaking from the gasket that goes around it over here. And you can see that on the transmission bell housing side. And it was actually leaking under the vehicle. I'm surprised it didn't break that many things taking this thing apart. This is the brittle vacuum evap hose here an aftermarket looking PCV hole, and of course the notorious coil pack tabs. I didn't break or strip any bolts yet. So here's what the empty engine bay looks like in this Lexus Camry. I was able to keep the AC intact and also the power steering fluid intact so I don't have to fix those. Check out that oil leak along that subframe from that front timing cover. That's a very common issue on these early 2GR engines. Going to take the opportunity while it's out to clean up this engine bay a little bit. I'm also going to be replacing these control arms because the bushings look shot. And the sway bar end links are pretty loose as well. Now this is the perfect time to replace your control arms because normally there's that big engine mount that sits right on top of here. You can see all the oil from the timing cover leak has deteriorated all the rubber on the control arm bushing here. There's just two bolts over here and then one bolt in that at the back there and it should come right out because I've already disconnected the ball joint anyways to get the CV axle out. Controllers that I'm using are from Mevotech. You can see it comes with the ball joint, but I'm actually going to disconnect it here because it's easier to put the ball joint onto the knuckle first. Pop off that control arm there. Here's the rotten control arm. Check out the bushings on the old control arm. Completely worn. These pieces are just coming apart. Looks like there's a bracket here that I have to change over to the new one. And before I put in the control arm, I'm going to also replace these sway bar end links because they feel a little loose. And I'm using a new stabilizer link from Mevotech. Don't you hate it when your impact won't zip this off and you got to do it the old school way? Yeah, and then of course right at the end here, the hex is going to strip. So here I've got the new ball joint, control arm, and the sway bar end link installed. Now I just gotta go do the other side. Well I use a little bit of engine degreaser and my brother's old toothbrush to give this engine bay a good scrub. Now I'm gonna rinse everything off. Here's a look at the engine that we pulled out. You can see there's a huge leak on the timing side of the engine. Very common for this vehicle, especially this early build 2GR engine. Make sure you stay tuned for the teardown video on that coming soon. Here I've got the new used engine. This is from an 09 ES350 and I've built made it up to the transmission here. And I'm going to have to change all the wiring harnesses because all junkyards like to just cut them. All right, just an update. I got the front cat on. I checked all the spark plugs and they're good because this is the best time to check them. Took the intake off because I also have to change the injector harness. And now we're going to put the main wiring harness on. Alright, so I'm all wired up and I'm about to line up the transmission with the engine. I can only imagine how difficult this would be while the transmission was in the car. This is probably the most difficult part of the job. Well, that took a while to get in, but I finally got it. Next, I'm going to put in the starter and the rest of this wiring harness over the transmission so it's easier to connect when I put it in. Alright, it took like four hours to prepare this engine. I hope everything works. I just gotta line it up and tuck it under that frame and drop it down. Alright, so I got the engine in with all three main engine mounts. The only casualty is this little oil level sensor, which I snapped the end off while trying to get it into the engine bay. Got the transmission mount over on the driver's side here. And finally the active engine mount in the front of the subframe. And now I begin the process of plugging everything back in. I really want to get this car started today, just to hear the engine. You know it's getting serious when it's after dark and you gotta bust out the lights. Anyway, I pretty much wired up this side of the engine, plugged in the computer on that side. Now I'm gonna go below and attach the flywheel, axles, and the exhaust. I've got all the flex plate bolts in there. Make sure you use some thread locker on those so they don't come loose. You already got the exhaust back up and I've also torqued down the engine mounts over here. I think it's time to drain the transmission fluid as well as whatever's left in the engine oil and replenish them with new fluids before I start this up. I'm gonna pop the axles back in so the transmission doesn't leak. Make sure you put some good anti-seize on this bearing because this thing is known to seize up against the carrier. All right, I got everything kind of connected, cobbled together here just so I can hear the engine start. Don't have any accessories or cooling system or AC or alternator. We're just going to start it off the battery. Hopefully the battery's strong enough. All right, here we go. First start. Oh, I tried to start. Let's try it again. Whoa. It started. Idle's pretty rough though. I don't know if you can see that, but it is misfiring. Oh, we got smoke. Okay, I wonder if that's just some residual oil or something. Well, the engine runs pretty good. It's just burning off all that anti-seize I used on the exhaust. I'm actually kind of surprised that it started up right away. It just has to relearn idle. I guess we'll come back tomorrow and reattach all the accessories and the front end. My wife is going to kill me for working so late, but I think it was worth it. Now I know that the new motor runs pretty good. 
So it's the next day, I know that the engine's working. Now I gotta finally button up some components along the side here, including the AC compressor, the alternator, the radiator and its hoses, and the radiator support, pieces of the air box. And at the bottom here, this power steering pump, which is gonna be a bear, as well as the axle and lower ball joint assembly. Finally got all the accessories on, but man, it's really a bear how they put this thing so close to the fender liner. It's so difficult to access just to do a simple serpentine belt job. Control arm and CV axle buttoned up on this side. Next up, we gotta get the air box, battery tray, and of course the dreaded radiator in here. All right, the next step is to fill up the coolant. All right, now it's time to start it up and make a mess. Well, the sun has set on me again, but I got all the car back together. Well, now that I know that it runs and I took it on a test drive, it's time to detail this thing and clean it inside and out. Now on the test drive, I did notice a squeal from the brakes and upon further diagnostics, check out how much play there is in that wheel bearing. It's pretty bad. I can't let this pass, so I'm going to have to change this out. And here's the new bearing I got from Mevotech. You can see this will be a Preston style bearing, which means I'm going to actually take it to a shop and get it installed. All right, so I just got back from the shop. You can see they pressed in the new bearing here and it spins nice and tight. Now there's no play. I just Gotta put the rest of the suspension back together. And here it is all cleaned up inside and out. I took it on a little test drive and it drives really beautiful. And the new engine is nice and quiet, no leaks or anything, and the transmission shifts well too. Have a listen to that engine. I also cleaned things up in the interior as well and took care of that. Not in bad shape for 213,000 kilometers. Now in all I didn't see I was supposed to be replacing the Camry with this Lexus, but my wife doesn't like that color. I don't know, you guys tell me, what do you think of this color? I know it's gold, but it's too beige for me. So I'm probably gonna have to sell it. If you know anybody in the Toronto area who's interested in this car, let me know. It's got 213,000 kilometers on it with no warning lights on the dash. And this 2GR FE runs and drives beautiful. Check it out. My dad actually has a facelift model. I like that one better. Let me know in the comment section down below if you like these car fix videos and make sure you subscribe if you wanna see more videos just like this one.